I've spent much of the last few years defending the opposite side of this argument. But I came into this debate with an open mind, and in researching and thinking about this question, I can tell you that I honestly believe that a thoracic epidural is the best option for my patients undergoing major open abdominal surgery. So here's why, in five slides in five minutes. The slides and a list of references are available at the SlideShare link shown. Let's get the undisputed facts out of the way first. There are clearly proven benefits to patients from a thoracic epidural in open abdominal surgery. A working epidural is the gold standard for analgesic efficacy in terms of both reducing the intensity of pain as well as opiate consumption. You get bilateral somatic and visceral analgesia that can be accurately targeted to the surgical area. Opiate sparing is particularly critical in abdominal surgery because it minimizes the risk of adverse effects, notably nausea and vomiting and intestinal ileus, two things we definitely don't want following abdominal surgery. Better GI outcomes have been demonstrated in meta-analyses in terms of both a decreased incidence of postoperative ileus and a more rapid return to normal GI function. There is good animal and preclinical evidence for improved splanchnic perfusion and gut microcirculation, so much so that our ICU colleagues are investigating thoracic epidurals as a treatment intervention in acute pancreatitis, with one propensity match study showing a significant decrease in mortality. Having said that, the evidence for overall postoperative mortality in abdominal surgery is conflicting, but only with regard as to whether there is a beneficial effect or not. It does not increase mortality. In fact, as many of you are aware, it reduces the risk of major morbidity, particularly from respiratory complications and cardiac arrhythmias. But what about all those risks? those bad things that can happen. Surely the risk-benefit ratio is unfavorable. Well, I'm not so sure about that. We all know the litany of bad things that can happen, but I think fear of the unfamiliar is leading us to overstate the risk involved. I unearthed three large database studies of thoracic epidurals looking specifically at associated complications. All came from European teaching hospitals with a high volume of epidurals, but where trainees as well as consultants perform the blocks. Let's start with permanent neurological deficits. Only one case was reported by von Hoslin, which was a dysesthesia in the inguinal region that was unclear in its etiology. Pooling the numbers from all the studies gives us an incidence of 7 per 100,000, with a calculated upper 95% confidence interval of risk being just 7 per 10,000. What about transient deficits? Data from Giebler and colleagues suggest that the risk is higher, 2.4 per thousand, but there were no motor deficits among this, and all of them resolved within several days. Epidural hematoma in the elective setting is much rarer for thoracic than lumbar epidurals, and only one case was reported, again giving us an incidence of 7 per 100,000, or 3.4 per 10,000 if you just consider the one study in which it was reported. Epidural abscess is a little more common, although still very rare. Three cases were reported for an incidence of 2 per 10,000, and all three were associated with catheters kept in place for five days or longer. Giebler and colleagues also looked at puncture and found an incidence of 7 in 1,000, which is lower than in lumbar epidurals. None of the patients had neurological deficits or post puncture headache. Now, one of the most common objections to thoracic epidurals is that it causes hypotension. However, there is no way that this can be worse than the hypotension after spinal anesthesia, yet we don't think twice about it in that context. It clearly is a question of mindset, education, and appropriate management. Our ICU colleagues using thoracic epidurals in critically ill patients have noted an incidence of only 8% similar to what is reported in meta-analyses of perioperative studies. And all of these respond readily to a fluid bolus with or without some vasopressors. Finally, the question of whether it impairs mobilization. Lower limb weakness is rare with thoracic epidurals, particularly if appropriately low concentrations of local anesthetic infusions are used. There is no increased risk of falls based on one review of more than 40,000 patients. And as to whether it is cumbersome or not, 
I would argue that it is not different from an IVPCA hookup and probably better than hookup to multiple abdominal wall catheters. But hold on, isn't it a technically challenging procedure? Aren't abdominal wall blocks much easier? Again, I think we might be overstating this. Thoracic epidurals provide bilateral coverage with a single puncture and a single catheter, unlike abdominal wall blocks. And if you have a good understanding of vertebral anatomy and proper technique, it is not a difficult procedure and one that I think can be successful most of the time. Slide the needle in alongside the spinous process to land on the lamina as a first step, and then just walk the tip progressively cephalet to slip into the interlaminar space and look for loss of resistance. As long as you avoid an excessively large lateral to medial angle, you'll be fine. If you have any doubts about locating the interlaminar space, ultrasound imaging is a simple and easy tool to use. Similarly, epidural catheter placement can be confirmed with little effort by either epidural stimulation or waveform analysis. There is no doubt that thoracic epidurals are less commonly performed than they used to be, and I acknowledge that there are some valid reasons for this. However, the resulting unfamiliarity with the procedure has set up a vicious circle that may lead to its gradual extinction. And this would be a shame, as it has well-demonstrated clinically meaningful benefits for patient outcomes. I do think that as our exposure to the technique diminishes, however, our perception of the risks involved start to diverge from the actual evidence. Similarly, we start to see it as a more difficult procedure than it really is. In reality, the risks and challenges of thoracic epidural analgesia are very manageable, with simple easy measures and with a little effort put into training, education and development of care pathways. For the sake of our patients, let's not see this valuable technique disappear in our lifetimes.